More than 300 arrests in Hong Kong today as thousands took to the streets to protest. This a day after Beijing passed its national security law. It's not just Hong Kongers who are affected by the new law, but everyone in the world. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi today said the one country, two systems policy is now dead. Taiwan's Navy practicing live fire drills simulating an enemy attack. A fleet of F-16 fighter jets carrying live Mk-84 bombs. Canada-China relations continue to deteriorate. This after Chinese authorities sentenced a Canadian millionaire to eight years behind bars. Some say it's in retaliation of Huawei CFO's arrest. And U.S. customs officials seized 13 tons of human hair from China. There's suspicion the beauty products are taken from Uyghur concentration camps. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Upstream from China's famous Three Gorges Dam, heavy rains have flooded the Yangtze River. The heightened water level directly impacts the safety of the dam, which is one of the largest in the world. If it collapses, up to 500 million people downstream would suffer the impact. A tributary that flows into the Yangtze River was hit hard by the heavy rains earlier this week. Its water level rose by almost 30 feet overnight. One person who lives in a town built on the riverbank told us it's the most severe flooding the area has seen for the last 50 years. Local streets are turning into rivers. The first floors of many houses have been submerged. Muddy water rushed down the mountain as bridges collapsed. Cars were seen floating in the floodwaters. Some of them still have their lights on. There's no way to know if people were still inside. Pushed by the strong current, one car smashed into a bridge pier. A tanker truck was also carried away by floods. One house's foundation became so saturated that the house cracked in half. One side fell into the turbulent river below. Within seconds, the debris was washed away. Now we turn to northeastern China. As Beijing's epidemic situation gets worse and worse, virus spread in other areas like northeastern China seems to have been forgotten. Two months ago in Harbin, one of the area's major cities, a cluster of cases was discovered. But authorities only reported some of them. Now, Harbin authorities aren't reporting any cases at all. According to them, everyone who had close contact with the era's virus patients was found to be clear of infection. Despite that, state-run media have reported that virus prevention measures should remain the new normal for the city. One Harbin resident told us that restrictions in local neighborhoods aren't as strict as before, but they're still under half-lockdown. People are still required to show their health tracing QR codes before entering almost anywhere. Some of the Chinese regime's departments remain closed, including the Department of Social Welfare. Middle schools are open only for students in the ninth grade or above. Primary school and kindergarten are also still closed. Restaurants are on and off and recently open for takeout. Now in some restaurants, customers can't eat inside again. And bus riders must scan their QR health codes before boarding. Hospitals are open, but patients must schedule an online appointment, and there's a limit on how many they'll accept. No emergency medical treatment or hospitalization is available either. One company in Harbin is also suffering due to the bankruptcy of an American retail giant, retailer GNC, known for selling vitamins, supplements and other wellness products, recently filed for bankruptcy due to financial pressure. The company says it'll close 800 to 1,200 of its stores. GNC's largest shareholder is Harbin Pharmaceutical Group Holdings Company, which had already invested $300 million into GNC. Harbin City is the biggest shareholder of Harbin Pharmaceutical Group. In other words, the company is controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. Forced labor in detention camps filled with Uyghurs is attracting attention. Federal authorities in New York recently seized a shipment of hair weaves and other beauty accessories from China. Their suspicion that the products are made with real human hair, taken from people locked inside the Chinese internment camp. The seized shipment came from an exporter in China's far west Xinjiang region, where the regime has detained an estimated one million or more Uyghurs, an ethnic minority. They're held in camps and prisons, where they're subjected to ideological brainwashing, 
forced to denounce their religion and language and are used as slaves. That slave labor is used to produce products that will later be exported overseas to places like Europe and the U.S. Now to India. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi says he wants to delete his Weibo account after the Indian government blocked almost 60 mostly Chinese apps. But the process for deleting VIP accounts on China's largest microblogging site is complex. Weibo doesn't allow users to delete their accounts. Only the platform can do so. The user can only delete their posts, which was done on Modi's account. But two posts still couldn't be deleted. That's because they included Modi's photos with Chinese leader Xi Jinping. Photos of the Chinese leader cannot be easily deleted from the app. Modi's account has since been shut down according to his request. TikTok, WeChat, UC Browser and CamScanner are among the Chinese apps that were blocked by the Indian government. The action came after various sources complained about data breaches, theft and transmission of user data to locations outside of India. More than 300 people were arrested today in Hong Kong after thousands took to the streets to protest. They came out to oppose Beijing's national security law one day after its passing. Hong Kong police arrested more than 300 people on Wednesday as protesters took to the streets in defiance of sweeping security legislation introduced by China. Police fired pepper pellets before arresting protesters inside and outside the luxurious Times Square shopping mall. Police said they had made more than 300 arrests for illegal assembly and other offences, with nine involving suspected violations of the new law. Earlier on Wednesday, water cannon was fired and Rive police used pepper spray on protesters and press at close range. China unveiled the details of the much-anticipated law on Tuesday after weeks of uncertainty. A top Beijing official calling the law a birthday gift to Hong Kong. The law punishes crimes of succession, subversion, terrorism and collusion with foreign forces, heralding a more authoritarian era for China's freest city and an Asian financial hub. Authorities in Beijing and Hong Kong have repeatedly said the legislation is aimed at a few, quote, troublemakers and will not affect rights and freedoms. The protests followed a flag-raising ceremony Wednesday morning to mark the 23rd anniversary of the former British colony's handover to China. Leader Carrie Lam said the law was the most important development since the city's return to Chinese rule. The enactment of the national law is regarded as the most significant development in the relationship between the central authorities and the HKSAR since Hong Kong's return to the motherland. It is a historic step to improve the system in Hong Kong to safeguard our country's sovereignty, territorial integrity and security. The new law will supersede existing Hong Kong laws where there is a conflict and interpretation of the law's powers belongs to Beijing. Judges for security cases will be appointed by the city's leader. The law has been widely condemned around the globe. And it seems Hong Kong police aren't just targeting protesters. A video posted online shows journalists being hit by a water cannon at close range. The force was enough to knock the journalist to the ground head first. Protesters and other bystanders rushed over to help him. The same incident was also captured from inside a nearby store. A reporter from Hong Kong Daily said he saw the same thing happen to his colleagues. Authorities in Beijing and Hong Kong have repeatedly said the new law is aimed at a few so-called troublemakers and will not affect the city's rights and freedoms, nor its financial investment interests. But critics fear it's an effort to end the region's pro-democracy movement and opposition to the Chinese regime. I think after they implement the national security law, Hong Kong's people now can't say no to a lot of things. The law has given Hong Kong's police officers and those of mainland China supreme power. They can interpret the law by themselves. Another Hong Kong resident said the region has already become another mainland Chinese city. 23 years after the handover, Hong Kong has already become another mainland Chinese city. There's nothing I can say. Actually, with or without the national security law, they can arrest you whenever they want. The police are unreasonable, and you can see there is police brutality. They have arrested about 10,000 people. 
but they claim not a single police officer broke the law. Don't you think it is ridiculous? Hong Kong legislator and member of the city's pro-democracy group, Claudia Mo, says the Chinese Communist Party is manipulating the law. They say day is night and dark is light. You just can't argue because uh, they are the law. But this is not rule of law. This is not even rule by law. This is rule by decree because anything is up to their interpretation. It's not just Hong Kongers who are affected by the new so-called national security law. According to China, it's everyone in the world. Article 38 says that this law shall apply to offenses committed against Hong Kong from outside the region by a person who is not a permanent resident of Hong Kong. And Article 29 says that people who provoke hatred towards the Chinese regime or the Hong Kong government could be given a life sentence. Therefore, this law affects not only Hong Kong residents, the 80,000 American citizens or the 30,000 U.K. citizens living in the region, but even foreigners who live outside of Hong Kong can be charged for things like speaking at a pro-Hong Kong rally, writing an op-ed article criticizing Beijing, or pushing for sanctions against China. Such people are at risk if they travel to China or simply transfer flights in Hong Kong. Experts say the law is even broader than China's own criminal legislation. George Washington University law professor Donald Clark wrote that Beijing is asserting extraterritorial jurisdiction over every person on the planet. The Canadian government warned its citizens about traveling to Hong Kong, saying they may be at an increased risk of arbitrary detention, leading to extradition to mainland China. But it's not just China or Hong Kong that can be dangerous. According to a report by BBC Chinese, a politics professor at Columbia University warns that overseas supporters of Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement should take notice. He said caution is needed when traveling to other countries and countries with extradition clauses with China should be avoided. Even though it's rare for countries to extradite prisoners on political grounds, experts worry that it's still possible for Beijing to do this under the new law. China claims that at least 53 countries have publicly said they support the law so far. That includes Russia, Vietnam, Iran, Serbia, Pakistan, Venezuela and others. Among them, many have extradition clauses with China. George Washington University law professor Donald Clark wrote on Twitter, Please remember that the problem with the Hong Kong national security law is not so much the specific acts it criminalizes. Those definitions can be stretched as far as one wants, but the institutions it establishes and empowers. He said the name and legal definition of the crime doesn't matter when you've been unreviewably identified as a serious national security threat and sent to the mainland for processing and imprisonment. Hong Kong authorities said today that the police can arrest people before giving any evidence. Hong Kong media quoted Hong Kong Security Secretary John Lee saying, No matter what the behavior in question is, as long as the police officer reasonably believes that it violates the law, they can arrest, investigate and search people according to the Hong Kong national security law and then charge the person when they find enough evidence. State Secretary Mike Pompeo said the U.S. is deeply concerned about people's safety in Hong Kong. China's new Hong Kong security law just came into effect. It not only applies to locals, but also foreigners as well. Chinese government, at least. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said that China's Hong Kong security law is an affront to all nations. The new law is intended not only for Hong Kongers, but also foreign nationals. Pompeo said the U.S. is deeply concerned about the safety of everyone in Hong Kong. Article 38 of the new law also purports to apply to offenses committed outside of Hong Kong by non-residents of Hong Kong, and this likely includes Americans. He added the State Department will continue to implement President Trump's directive to end Hong Kong's special status. When asked how far the U.S. is willing to go to push for Hong Kong's freedom. I'll just repeat what the president said. He wants to ensure, with a handful of exceptions, that uh, Hong Kong is treated just like mainland China because that's the way that General Secretary Xi has chosen to treat that place as well. Pompeo said a business advisory will be released today. And it's for companies who do business with entities linked to human rights abuses in China's Xinjiang region. 
CEOs should read this notice closely and be aware of the reputational, economic, and legal risks of supporting such assaults on human dignity. He added that the U.S. will continue to build a global coalition that understands the threat from the Chinese Communist Party on the free world. He said it isn't a U.S.-China challenge, but also a challenge between freedom and authoritarianism. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says it seems that China's one country, two systems framework is dead under the so-called national security law. Hong Kong activists testified on what the regime's policy means for the city. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more. 23 years after Hong Kong's handover, a House committee discusses whether the Chinese Communist Party's promise of Hong Kong autonomy was kept. Pelosi says it seems the one country, two systems policy is dead under the so-called national security law. Is this the end of the one country, two systems? It seems as it is. As I have stated, Beijing's so-called national security passed on the eve of the 23rd anniversary of the handover of Hong Kong from the UK to China signals the death of the one country, two systems principle. Republican Michael McCall seconded the speaker on the bipartisan concern. Yesterday, the CCP took a sledgehammer to one country, two systems by passing sweeping so-called national security legislation that strips away the autonomy of Hong Kongers, violating the terms of the Sino-British Treaty. A variety of issues were discussed. Lawmakers and activists called for passing bills that would punish bad actors or offer a path to citizenship for Hong Kongers. Activists from the city risk facing criminal charges under the new law to testify to Congress on the problem they now face. Under this legislation, Beijing just passed 24 hours ago. Anyone who would dare to speak up would likely face imprisonment once Beijing targeted you. So much is now lost in the city I love, the freedom to tell the truth. President Trump has said that Hong Kong is no longer autonomous enough, that its special trading status would come to an end, and that Chinese officials who participate in the erosion of its autonomy would be sanctioned. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. And in response to Beijing's national security law, the U.S. is offering refuge to Hong Kongers in need under the Hong Kong Safe Harbor Act. The bipartisan bill was introduced by Senators Marco Rubio and Bob Menendez. They were later joined by Senators Todd Young, Ben Cardin and Jeff Merkley. The bill would essentially speed up Hong Kong's admission process to the U.S. Senator Rubio said the world witnessed the courage of Hong Kong's pro-democracy activists, who last year took to the streets to defend their autonomy from China's authoritarian grip. Curtis added that the Hong Kong Safe Harbor Act will empower Hong Kongers to continue their fight for freedom, while letting them know the U.S. and global community have their back. In Taiwan, a fleet of F-16 fighter jets departed from Hualien Jiashan Air Base this week to perform a military drill. The jets were carrying live MK-84 general-purpose bombs, which were dropped into the ocean off of Taiwan's eastern coast. The drill simulated an attack on enemy ships seeking to reach the shore. Weighing almost 2,000 pounds, the MK-84 is nicknamed the Hammer because of its considerable power. More drills are scheduled for later this month. Taiwan's Navy is planning its first live-fire torpedo drill in 13 years. It'll happen on July 15th off the island's coast. The following day, military forces will conduct a live-fire anti-landing exercise at multiple bases simultaneously. Taiwan's president says she is very disappointed by the law imposed on Hong Kong. She said it proves that the one country, two systems formula is not feasible for the mainland together with Taiwan. Mainland China once promised Hong Kong that they wouldn't change its system for 50 years. The passing of the national security law indeed broke this promise. We feel very disappointed. This also proves that one country, two systems doesn't work. President Tsai Ing-wen was the first government leader anywhere to pledge measures to help Hong Kong people who wish to leave due to the tightening controls by the communist regime. The contentious law targets crimes of secession, subversion, terrorism and collusion with foreign forces. If prosecuted, offenders face up to life in prison, heralding a more authoritarian era for the Asian financial hub. 
The law was widely condemned in democratic Taiwan. Taiwan opened an office to help Hong Kongers leaving the region. The establishment of this office not only expresses Taiwan's support for Hong Kong's democracy and freedom, but also manifests the determination of our concern for Hong Kongers. They also hope to seize the opportunity to attract professionals and capital from Hong Kong. So far, about 200 people already fled to Taiwan from Hong Kong since pro-democracy protests began last year. Taiwan's Mainland Affairs Council chairman warned that Beijing aims to target people in other countries with the law. The law covers permanent and non-permanent residents of Hong Kong. The so-called Hong Kong National Security Law not only targets residents in Hong Kong, it's also an order issued by the empire to people all over the world. Taiwan shares with the Hong Kong protesters a deep antipathy for the Chinese regime. China's communist leaders have never renounced the use of force to bring Taiwan under its control. Beijing denies stifling Hong Kong's freedoms and has condemned Taiwan's plans to help people there. Canada-China relations are deteriorating after Chinese authorities sentenced a Chinese-Canadian millionaire to eight years behind bars. Her sentencing comes after Canada refused to release Chinese tech giant Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou back to China. China has sentenced Chinese-Canadian millionaire Sun Qian to eight years in jail. That's after she was already detained for three years. A few days before her sentencing, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau rejected China's request to release Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou in exchange for the return of two Canadians detained in China. Some say Sun's sentence is China's way of exacting revenge. Sun co-owned a successful biochemical company with her husband in Beijing. She was arrested in 2017 after police found books related to Falun Gong, a meditation practice, in her house. The system is a Chinese spiritual discipline practiced by tens of millions around the world. She started practicing in 2014. She was charged for what authorities called using cult organizations to undermine national law. But legally, the Chinese regime doesn't list Falun Gong as a cult in any of its official documents. Sun was severely mistreated in detention. She was forced to wear special shaped shackles that prevented her from eating or using the restroom on her own. She also wasn't allowed to change her clothes for two months and was woken up every 30 minutes while sleeping. Most lawyers she hired eventually quit under pressure from Chinese authorities. One lawyer, Xie Yanyi, was even disbarred for trying to defend Sun. According to him, if the Falun Gong injustice cases are not stopped, the disasters in China will not cease. Xie explained that during Sun's detention, Chinese authorities tried to force her, a naturalized Canadian citizen, to give up her Canadian citizenship. In the end, authorities only allowed Sun to use CCP-designated lawyers. Chinese lawyer and human rights activist Cheng Guangcheng says he believes Chinese authorities put Sun in jail for two reasons. First, because they're after Sun's $300 million worth of business assets. And second, as revenge after Canada's decision not to hand over Huawei's Meng Wanzhou. Reporting by Xu Wenhui, NTD News. A new congressional report says expansion of U.S. multinational businesses in China for the past two decades may threaten America's competitiveness and tech leadership. This comes as tensions rise between the world's two largest economies. A new report by a congressional commission warns the vast expansion of U.S. multinational businesses in China risks diminishing America's innovative capacity and leadership. The report analyzed nearly two decades of U.S. economic and trade data. It shows that U.S. commercial assets in China surged nearly 15-fold from 2000 to 2017. In 2017, U.S. companies hired 1.7 million people in China. It nearly increased six times from 2000. Among the industries, U.S. corporations invested the most capital in manufacturing, and it's most strongly focused in computers and electronic products. This strengthened China's position in the global technology supply chains. In turn, this centrality enables the Chinese regime to coerce technology or intellectual property from multinationals. The report says this may, quote, indirectly erode the United States' domestic industrial competitiveness and technological leadership relative to China. Also, on Wednesday, the Trump administration warned U.S. companies about the risks in maintaining supply chains linked with human rights abuses in China. 
and some states will end their enhanced unemployment benefits a week sooner than expected. Under the CARES Act, the last day is July 31st, but because some states' payment cycles end on July 25th or 26th, that will be the last day of the program. Officials in the Trump administration had said the extra benefits were discouraging people from going back to work. Here's the details. The extra $600 a week in virus unemployment aid might end early for some Americans. Under the CARES Act, additional benefits are supposed to stop at the end of July. But some states, like California and New York, are terminating the payments a week early. For many states, the last day for paying benefits this month ends on Saturday or Sunday, July 25th or 26th. But according to the CARES Act, Friday, July 31st is the final paying day. In the U.S., over 40 million people have lost work due to the CCP virus pandemic. Many businesses are hurting from stay-at-home orders and reopening restrictions. The Small Business Aid Program, called the Paycheck Protection Program, was also about to expire this week. But with just hours to spare, the Senate unanimously passed an extension to the program. The move came Tuesday night, extending the PPP to August 8th. The program was set to expire with more than $130 billion in allocated funds that were left unused. The program provides aid to small businesses struggling during the virus pandemic. The Democrat-controlled House of Representatives must also approve the extension. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell said a full economic recovery is unlikely until people feel safe going outside. Congress has signed off on about $3 trillion in aid so far, but policymakers say more will be needed. And in France, healthcare workers emerging from the country's virus crisis to protest for better pay. They say their conditions hamper their efforts to give the care that's needed. Our France correspondent David Vives has the story. Hundreds of healthcare workers marched in Paris on June 30th, renewing a call on the government to provide sufficient financing to hospitals nationwide. Despite being praised with daily applause by people on their balconies during the height of the outbreak, health workers said they should instead be rewarded for their work with higher salaries and more funding for equipment and personnel. We are underpaid and we live in a precarious situation. We studied for five years and we are paid like someone who has three years of study. Moreover, it's hard for us to provide good quality care because of the poor working conditions. France has one of the highest virus death tolls in Europe. Some unions blame the poor working conditions. For these two doctors working at Hospital PTA Sapatreer, it's also about the conditions inside the public hospitals. Public hospitals need more beds to welcome patients. It's a problem that has existed for years. And there was a lack of equipment required, such as respiratory devices. Last year, healthcare workers were striking and protesting against the government, but the movement was put on hold since the pandemic. They returned to the streets in June, sparking clashes with police after France lifted its two month lockdown in mid May. The French government has promised to reform the healthcare system, which it says will involve massive investment and greater appreciation shown to healthcare workers. But labor unions say that's not enough. Reporting by David Vivez, NTD News, Paris. Here at China In Focus, we dedicate ourselves to bringing you truthful, unbiased reporting. Don't forget to like and subscribe for the latest updates and see you tomorrow.